Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This week we have something a little bit different. Rather than a review, which is what we've been doing for the last several weeks, we have a question. A question that has been asked by a viewer. And thanks to Richard Adcock for this pressing and important question. Why is so much Steampunk YA? My first response to this was, well, is it really? I didn't think so, but perhaps it is. So we have to answer that question first, and once we have answered that in the affirmative, or maybe the negative, we can go on to say, why is that? So the first question to ask is, what is YA, by the way? Well, it's young adult fiction. And this is a demographic category invented by the publishing industry. And it means ages 12 to 18, perhaps as late as 12 to 20. And it is marketing speak. And as you'll note that most of these ages are not adult, at least not in the USA. And that's because I think that they don't want to insult their audience because teenagers always want to think of themselves as more mature and capable than they really are, right? So we don't want to call them children. <laughs> so, YA has usually got a young protagonist from around that age, maybe a little bit older, you know, early 20s, and they also concern themselves with uh, basically problems and issues that are important to teenagers, that they would consider something that uh, they would be interested in, like, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, that sort of thing, you know, finding your way in the world, dealing with your parents, and uh, finding a career, those sort of things. So it's a popular genre, it's an important genre in publishing. An interesting fact is that about 50% of all YA books are purchased and read by adults. And in a way that says, who cares if they're aimed at a younger audience. If they're good, we're going to read them anyway. For example, Harry Potter. So, I was trying to find out, you know, A, is steampunk predominantly YA? And B, uh, what is the predominance of YA in the overall market? Now, it's kind of hard to find good statistics for free. <laughs> <laughs> on the internet because they all want to sell you these things, the, all these uh, marketing firms that gather this data. Now you can find various snippets here and there that are open, you know, like for this year it went up and that year it went down and the sales were this and, and that. And I thought maybe J ChatGPT would aggregate those for me, but no. Basically it told me to look at what industry sites. Well, screw that. <laughs> They're going to want money. And, you know, you think, oh, they must be afraid of offending these powerful companies. They're fine with putting freelance artists out of business, but no, we won't offend these companies by taking, you know, open data and putting them in a format that an average person can use. That's my rant. Anyway, I did eventually find some stuff on uh, a site called wordsrated.com, and I don't know how authentic this is, but most of my statistics come from them. And so, I, they kind of sound real, so we'll assume that they are. First of all, uh, YA is about 5% of the overall fiction market. So that's pretty small, much smaller than I thought. And it has been growing, but it started out from like three. So it's a huge growth, but nonetheless, it is much smaller than you would think from all the fuss they make about it. And so my next question was, how is that related to steampunk? I mean, how much of the steampunk uh, fiction output is YA? I looked at my list, which is about 150 novels, and I looked at Wikipedia's list of steampunk literature works, which is about 80. Strangely, 50 of those I have not read yet. So we combine the unique, unique ones of these two lists into one list, and it's 200, about 200. We Remove the anthologies by various authors because I'm not interested in one-offs, you know, like somebody writes one steampunk uh, short story. Don't care about that. And then I filter out the 
authors, because most authors will write one series in this particular genre, you know, like, say, Philip Pullman. Uh, and uh, so this kind of indicates how many unique kind of steampunk worlds have been created in fiction. I ended up with 113, not including my own, and of those I went through and looked at which ones I knew to be YA, that had YA elements, or that were listed as YA authors. To some degree I had to guess because a lot of these listed works did not have Wikipedia pages, and I didn't want to you know, pour through Amazon and everything for hours and hours. So I came up with a rough guess of 27 out of 113, which gives us close to a quarter, close to a quarter of all the works are YA, which is a pretty big percentage. It's a much bigger percentage than uh, literature uh, overall. So, in that sense, it is more YA than most genres. So the next question is why? Well, I came up with two answers. They are both hypotheses. <laughs> I wouldn't call them theories because you need some proof. These are more like educated guesses. And the two of these educated guesses are, number one, whimsy, and number two, historical accident. And we'll go into these one at a time. By whimsy, I mean silliness, uh, uh, childlike fun, uh, naivete, a optimistic, rose-colored view of the world. And I think steampunk has that in the sense that it kind of copies the Victorian viewpoint, the kind of the optimistic viewpoint of mankind succeeding and getting better and the conquering nature, etc., etc., and moving out into space. So that's part of it. Part of it also is that uh, some of the earlier works that are steampunk-like had kind of a childlike or silly or whimsical or campy, as we'd say in the 60s, Kind of, kind of that kind of feeling to them. First one on my list is a children's book called Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, The Magical Car. <laughs> and this was published in 1964 by Ian Fleming, the James Bond guy. Now this book was written for his son and involved this magical car that had all these wonderful gadgets in it. It's kind of like a one of a kind or very few were made and the father of this family restored it and they had all these adventures in this car which could even fly. So of course I love this. They made a great movie out of it. And it had a very steampunkish feel and it kind of had this old timey feel. And so in the 60s that would be you know almost the turn of the century, right? Furthermore, there were two TV series that are also regarded as steampunk and they were very whimsical and almost naive and silly. First was with Wild Wild West. Uh, which ran from 1965 to 1969 on CBS. And it was The Adventures of Two Secret Service Agents, James West and Artemis Gordon. And this was one of my very favorites as a kid. And there were all these crazy devices, uh, near escapes, and super villains were plotting to control the world. <laughs> Second one came a bit, a bit later. And this was Briscoe County Jr. in the early 90s. And this was ran on Fox from 1993 to 94, and it's about a lawyer turned bounty hunter. And this was intentionally kind of a comedy, kind of a spoof or a send up. But we again we have this cam, campy, whimsical feeling, which you know lends itself well to kids. You know, kids like stuff that's silly. You know, Captain Underpants, that sort of sort of thing. <laughs> Finally, my final example is Mortal Engines, from the very early 2000s, uh, written by Philip Reeve and published. And Scholastic, the four books were published from 2001 to 2006. And this is a far future dystopian world, but it's some very crazy ideas, you know, these mobile cities that are uh, kind of rolling on tank treads over this dystopian landscape and crunching each other, you know, eating each other, <laughs> recycling the uh, metal, and the people inside are all kind of, you know, captured or enslaved or whatever. And it's got young, youthful protagonists, so it's a YA. So we have all those examples why people would think it was childlike and whimsical. On the opposite side is the inventor of the steampunk term, Keiru Jeter, who envisioned it as a dark thing. Because he was a big cyberpunk writer, and cyberpunk is pretty much always dark and uh, dystopian. And he, he wanted to write about the Victorian era 
in that same way. So that's why steampunk is a takeoff on cyberpunk. And that's why a lot of those early writers did have these very dark and broody and kind of, uh, you know, doom, doom-like <laughs> portrayals. Uh, and some of them got really upset. Some of these writers got really upset when others, like myself, made it more of a fun and optimistic thing. They didn't see that as proper. <laughs> I think really though that the whimsy won out and that's why the childlike and, and fun nature of steampunk kind of showed it as being friendly to kids or at least something that kids should like. Second of my major hypotheses is that it was a historical accident that steampunk and YA happened to be super big at the same time. And here's where some of those sales statistics come in. And, and again, like I said, they were really hard to find. They were really hard to get, get a handle on them. So these are probably going to be very approximate. But around 2012, when steampunk first came into its own as a very popular thing, the publishing industry was in a slump. In fact, book sales were at a a low over several years. I have no idea why. I can't think of anything major happening at the time. We had a financial crisis in 2008, but uh, you know what was what was up with 2012? I don't know. In any case, at that time, I suppose they were thinking, "Wow, we have to find a way to sell more books." So at that same time, uh, YA was big in the sense that several important movies and very profitable movies were being made from YA works, in particular, Harry Potter. Now, J.K. Rowling started the Harry Potter series in around 1997, and they were so popular that the movies started in 2001 and went through 2011 and made buckloads of money. <laughs> so they were thinking, wow, this is a good opportunity. Now, likewise, the Hunger Games series started off in 2012 and went through 2015, also extremely profitable. Now, there were a number of other uh, great YA works made into movies, some which were not as successful, including Aragon, the one about dragons, uh, Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief, which was about Greek gods as teenagers <laughs> in the modern world, the Golden Compass, which had a lot of steampunk-like uh, characteristics in the first book, at least, of the trilogy, which also got made into a movie in 2007, unfortunately not successful, and Mortal Engines as well, which eventually became a sadly unsuccessful movie. These works were, I think, seen as a very good opportunity by writers and the publishing industry both. And YA works were very, very heavily promoted at that time. And so, because of that, we had, you know, people writing stuff like Leviathan. You know, Sherry Priest's um, Clockwork Century, that the first book had a youthful protagonist. So it could possibly be considered YA, even though it was fairly dark. I think that gave the idea that, yeah, we'll take these two great things and we'll put them together and they'll sell like crazy. Well, it didn't necessarily work out so well. I mean, you look at what is popular at conventions and, and that's often what people are dressing up as. People like to dress up as their favorite characters. And as far as the younger people, you don't really see them in these steampunk outfits. It seems like more of a Gen X thing. And maybe some of the younger boomers, like myself, and also maybe some of the older millennials, but it's mostly that somewhat older crowd. So one possible exception is like young women who are attractive, who want to show off their cleavage uh, with corsets and low tops. And that, I think, is less dedication to the steampunk ideas than more like narcissism. <laughs> Let me get on OnlyFans, that kind of thing. If you want to look at what younger people are, are wearing and, and following, it's all anime. <laughs> they want to dress up as anime characters. So if you think of One Piece, for example, as kind of steampunk, well then maybe that qualifies. But in general, no. In general, no, unfortunately. So whereas YA was a big deal with steampunk for a time when it first started, I would say it isn't really anymore with a very few examples, such as Shelley Adina's wonderful series, Magnificent Devices, most are written at older audiences. You know, interesting things like alt histories and, you know, different perspectives like some of the black-oriented steampunk I've reviewed. 
and also romance. That's big because A, female audiences love romance and women are a big huge part, a majority of the fiction reading audience, and the steampunk era is kind of a very romantic era when people wore these very attractive and fancy clothes. We had well-defined sex roles, we had heroic masculine men, and beautiful feminine females. And so it kind of lends itself well to romance. In fact, we even have a category called steampunk erotica. <laughs> and I've read some of those and they are hilarious. You know, especially when you get up with purple, purple prose like, you know, <laughs> his, uh, you know, manhood and all that. <laughs> and all these funny euphemisms. Not my thing. But, nonetheless, it's not really a YA dominant market anymore. So in general, to sum it up, YA was kind of dominant in steampunk early on. It isn't any longer. But if there was a reason for it, I think it was, number one, because it's perceived as whimsical and more childlike, and two, because of the historical accident of steampunk and YA being really big at the same time. So, this has been my show on Why is so much steampunk YA? Hope you liked it. Please feel free to ask other burning questions that you want me to attempt to answer. I'll be happy to do so. And please like and subscribe so we can continue to get out the good steampunk word and talk about science fiction works that are not necessarily that well known and promote them. And also, check out my works on Amazon. I'll have a list of these links in the description below. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying, I just amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future, and the present is extraordinary.